hi. Oh, people are there. Hello. I've never done this before, so this is very strange. Um, my name is S.J. Watson, uh, and I am shortly going to be joined, hopefully, by Tess Gerritsen, which I'm really excited about. There she is. Let me see if I can let her in. It says waiting, so hopefully that will make sense soon. There we yeah. are. Hello. There you are. Yes. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm always amazed when these things work. <laughs> yeah. It's the first time I've done it, which I didn't admit earlier. And they were saying, you'll be fine with this, won't you? And I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. But, yeah. Oh, no, it's really scary, don't you think? <laughs> well, it's just strange not getting any feedback and thinking, is anybody there? Do, do people, are people listening? Is this making any sense? Anyway, how are you? You look very I'm well. Good. I'm good. How are you doing? Are, are you in England or are you in France? No, I, I've, I haven't been in France. That was a complete, um, that was a complete uh, miscommunication, I think. No, I yeah. So, no, I'm, I'm in East Sussex at the moment. So, kind of halfway between Brighton and London. So, and where are you? I'm in Maine. I'm at home in Maine, um, yeah. where it's, it's beautiful. And I haven't left the state of Maine in, ooh, six months. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, well, I feel like, in a way, I feel like I'm in Maine as well at the moment, because I'm uh, about 140 pages into your new book. So... I'm in a very uh, spooky house in Maine right now. So that's, uh, in fact, I'm slightly resentful I've had to do this because it's torn me away. So um, that's very exciting. But we're going to talk about that a bit later, aren't we? The, the but I finished your book last night, so. Oh, wow. You're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, this is very, uh, when I, can't, I was trying to work out, trying to remember when we last saw each other. I, mean, I think it was before I go to sleep for me, wasn't it? And, and which book were you? I Right. I think it was you were just introducing before I go to sleep. And there was all this exciting information about um, a film deal. And, mm. I was, and then I loved your book. I mean, it was like, I think it was one of the best, as I said in my quote, one of the best debuts I've ever read. And it was, yeah. um, you know, it just was captivating. Mm. Well, thank you. That was, yeah, that was it ten, must have been nine or 10 years ago now. I guess so. I guess if you so. believe, yeah. So scary how time goes, isn't it? So it's interesting to me that this new book, um, your first book is about memory, mm. and this book has a lot to do with mm. memory as well, the lack of it, and um, <laughs> or the, the missing memories anyway. So um, what's always fun for me is to find out where ideas come from, where, where you know, what inspired the story. Mm. Yeah, no, it was a weird one because <clears throat> I'm obviously... I'm obviously, I must be fairly obsessed, or not obsessed perhaps, but I must be fairly interested in memory and identity and stuff like that, because in both in, in this book, Final Cut, and Before I Go to Sleep, I've kind of, you know, um, e explored those, and to a lesser extent with the second book, Second Life, but yeah, I've sort of explored those issues. So yeah, it's, it's funny, because when I sit down to write, I don't, I don't kind of consciously, I don't know if you're the same, but I don't consciously decide, okay, this is going to be my memory book, or this is going to be my dissociative amnesia book or whatever you know it just kind of comes out that way but because the the, the 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 main starting point for this book was that was the idea of um documentary filmmakers that was kind of what I was really interested in at the time um yeah. there's a very famous uh well it's not very famous but there's a very well there's a well-known documentary in the uk called um three salons at the seaside which i found absolutely fascinating it's um i think it's from the early 80s and it, it tells the story uh of uh hairdressers in the north of England and the sort of women that go there um, to get their weekly shampoo and set so it's really fascinating because like it's it, on the on the surface it's like it's about hairdressers hair salons but it, of course it's not really it's really about these women and their lives and their troubles and their you know day-to-day um, -day battles and things and so I found that really fascinating so I was kind of thinking about about documentaries really with this book um, but you know I think I'm always going to be writing psychological thrillers so, so <laughs> those kind of other elements sort of ended up kind of getting uh, getting sucked in so yeah that was but how about you how with this because this book is quite a different book for you isn't it well it came out i know it's completely different it's um when i was growing up i used to love reading gothic novels and you know the elements of a gothic novel is mm. it's, it's a young woman generally virginal yeah uh, there's a spooky house and yeah there's a, there's a there's a dark and handsome you know <laughs> hero so i i wanted to play with that all of those elements in a new sort of very sexy gothic novel mm. and i thought what if i made the hero not alive what if i made him <laughs> a 
Yeah. And, and it really, I think it really started off with this, this question of what makes the perfect lover. And mm. what if you could have a lover who could keep all your, all your secrets, you never had to reveal to anybody all the embarrassing things that you really want to do, you know, mm. um, when, you, when you make love. And so that's, that's how it all came together is what if you have the perfect lover and what if the perfect lover is not even alive? Yeah. What if a ghost that comes in the night and then disappears and in the meantime, <laughs> had a great time? <laughs> that sounds kind of ideal in lots of ways, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and, and not only that, you don't have to wash their clothes. You don't have to cook breakfast for them. It's just like they're there when you need them. Um, yeah. So, so it, it started off with that, that exploration of ghosts and perfect lovers. And then, of course, the old crime writer comes back into the story. And I thought, well, what if people have died in this house? What if every woman mm. who lived there has died and you don't? She doesn't know whether the ghost is responsible or not. So mm. that, that's, that's, you know, it's, where do books come from? I have no idea. I just, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just come and you start to play with them and you find out, you discover things about yourself and about Absolutely, yeah. as you're writing them. And I think what I discovered as I was writing was that these, all these things that happen in this book are really kind of embarrassing. Um, they're the kinds of things that can make you feel really guilty. And so the underlying theme of shame really became so important, both to, you know, the story and to the character. Mm. And what is she ashamed of? And what, mm. what are these ghost visitations really about for mm. her on a psychological level? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I, I was struck when I started it that with both of our books that we're talking about, you know, with, with you with The Shape of Night and me with Final Cut, we've kind of, we've got big spooky old houses um, with kind of yeah. strange, strange stories um, and hidden passages and things like that, haven't we? It's kind of, it's quite, it's quite weird that, that we've both sort of found ourselves drawn to the modern Gothic. Although, well, you I mean, you know. England has so many creepy big mm. old houses and I live in the state of Maine where we have, you know, we are reportedly the most haunted state in the mm. United States, so we have <laughs> we have creepy old houses here. But there's, I think we're all fascinated by things that scare us, and and for me, and especially um, the idea of whether ghosts actually exist. Yeah. So, do you think they do? No, I personally don't. My mother believed yeah. in them. My mother saw them, um, and I've spent my whole life looking for them, and I've never, I've never spotted one. <laughs> but would you like to? I think I would like to. I think we would all like that. I wouldn't. You wouldn't? No. I think I'm actually, it's quite interesting reading your book at the, right now because I'm living, I'm by myself in a house that is not, I mean, it's not ancient, but it's from 1912. So it's over 100 years old and it, it feels quite um, it has spooky. Been. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of, no. I'm really relieved that you say it's not based on a true story, your book, because otherwise, <laughs> like, no. Terry says ghosts exist. Yeah, well, I <laughs> know they, they don't, but I've been just, I mean, not only because of this story, I've been collecting haunted house stories for a very long time mm. um, from people who believe that they live in a haunted house. I mean, it, I, in this little town, there's probably three or four rumored haunted houses and mm. you, know, you get into it. And what are people actually experiencing? And, mm. and sometimes it's just like noises in the night, which are creaks of old houses. But mm. sometimes really things that um, are, are, you wonder how to explain them. Yeah, I've just, I've just got to the vase leaping off the, uh, the mantelpiece. So now I'm, now I'm kind of like worried that there's gonna be a similar thing happen here, so yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, let's talk about, you know, because you, your book also has something that I have, which is a narrator that you're not entirely sure of, the unreliable mm. narrator, which was true mm. for before I go to sleep as well. Mm. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think I've always I've always loved those sort of books that where, where there are those kind of big question marks over people, and um, and I think I, I do like it, an unreliable narrator, especially if it's a a, a, a a narrator who doesn't really know that they're un unreliable. So, yeah. and she, I suppose that's the difference because in Before I Go to Sleep, she knew she you know the character knew what she she knew she had this memory problem and she knew that she didn't know so much and so she knew that kind of my my screen's gone dark so she sort of knew that there were big gaps so she was an unreliable narrator who knew she was whereas I suppose in this book um, it's an unreliable narrator who doesn't really know that she is in many ways so yeah I think I think there's just so many kind of interesting and exciting things you can do when you when you have when you have that character, because both of our books are written in the first person, aren't they, with this time around? Which is, is yeah. that a new thing for you? Is that is that is that it your? It is. Thing? 
um, there's something very intimate about first person. Mm. Um, mm. I, yeah, I mean, you really, really get to know somebody from mm. their interior monologue. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, if they're unreliable in a sense that they don't even know what's real and what's not, mm. uh, that helps as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, story, exactly. Because yeah. I mean, one of the struggles I had with this book actually was, um, it's very difficult to talk about because I don't want to give the twist away to anybody who might want to want to read it. But um, the, the the one of the twists, I couldn't. I it needed to. I'm how what to say. So because I knew that she would. She knew it's one. It's something that she wasn't unreliable. Like she knew this herself. So it's like given that it's in the first person. What what point do you reveal it to the reader? At what point is it natural for her to to say it? But then the, but then there are other twists. I don't. Am I making sense? There are other twists that because she doesn't realise them. Mm -hmm. Um, then I can I can withhold them from the reader as well. So I think that's the sort of advantage of having an unreliable narrator, isn't it? It's, it, it, yeah. it's uh, you can you can drop things in when the character would find them out. I think that was what what I was trying to do before I go to sleep was, you know, you the reader always knows exactly what the character does when the when the when the when the character finds something out, the reader finds it out as well. There's no kind of sense of of a difference or or the character being. The reader being on a different journey from the character, knowing more or le or in fact less than them. So that was quite an unusual thing, um, which isn't you know is not quite the same with this book. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what what I loved about especially about this book was that that sense of of place, um, mm. all these incredibly sensuous details about the seaside and the, mm. and the fog and the slippery streets and, the, <laughs> and everything. And I was I was transported there immediately so what is this place in reality <laughs> well it's it's fictional it's a place in the book it's a place called blackwood bay as you know and it's a fictional place but it's very very heavily based on a real place in the north of england north yorkshire called robin hood's bay um which is quite an unusual and very unique and sort of magical place because well for several reasons but one of the reasons is that it, it feels very sort of icy oh excuse me <laughs> It feels very. I've got you on a tripod, and it's not really working very well. Um, it feels very. I, sort of, I have you on a music stand. So. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have gone for that. You just tipped over backwards. Um, yeah, that, that might be better. Um, Robin Hood's, but yeah, it's very. It feels very magical because when you're there, you feel very isolated because you have to drive over the moors uh, mm -hmm. to get there. So you know, you, you know, windswept moors and everything like that. You know, and. Um, and then when you arrive, it's a very, very, as in the book, actually, it's a very steep road down from the top where you kind of arrive and all the all the all the buildings and all the shops and pubs and everything like that. Um, it's, I mean, it's a tiny place. It's a very small place, but they're all kind of clinging to the rock face down this very steep road. So cars can't really get down there, especially if the weather is bad. So um, and, and all the all the sort of streets uh come off this main road they're kind of basically pedestrian alleyways got ginnels which i don't think is an american word i tried it no, out with some american it. librarians the other day and they didn't get it either. but yeah so uh, little alleyways basically okay. and, you, know, so you wander up these alleyways and and you to turn a corner and you know you don't know whether you're gonna you're gonna arrive in a courtyard with a church or there might be a shop or there might be a few more houses or it might be a dead end i mean literally it literally is like that. And then there are also, as I think I mentioned in the book, there are these stories about Robin Hood's Bay that, because it used to be a smuggling village, it's where they used to land with their contraband. And it used to be said that you could, um, they could unload their contraband in, in one of the caves and work their way through these tunnels, part, many of which I think were, um, were uh, excavated by the people, by the smugglers themselves. And they could get their goods from the sea level up to the cliff um, level. Um, without it ever seeing the light of day through this, this network of underground tunnels. And I think I was just kind of really fascinated by that and the met obviously yeah. the metaphor there for secrets and hidden truths and, you know, things being excavated and coming to the surface, which sort of felt right for this book. So, but I didn't want to, I mean, I, I toyed with the idea of setting it in Robin Hood's Bay because it, it is such a beautiful place. And, it, you know, it's very definitely inspired by there. But um, I decided I wouldn't because... Having read it, you know that some pretty bad things happen there. <laughs> and there's some pretty, yeah. yeah. You, don't, you really don't want to get the town ticked off at you, do you? <laughs> well, exactly. I thought it would be ironic if this place that I really love and really enjoy going to would, would never have me again, drum me out of town and refuse to let me back because I'd written this, this book where I've called them all kinds of, uh, you know, accused them of all kinds of misdemeanors and crimes. Right. So, uh, horrible crimes. Yeah. yeah. So I decided I would fictionalize it. Um, yeah. So, yeah.
but um well I, I did the same thing i did not want to use a real town even though i live in a town that's very much like the town that's mm. that's in the shape of night because mm. um you know when you get into the psychology of small towns there's all kinds of dirty secrets and um i wouldn't want my my neighbors to think i'm talking about them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so is the house based on a real house uh, Brody, well, you know, what is Brody's a, watch yeah yes i live in a seafaring town um, right. which is very famous for sea captains and houses. And when you go down our main street, you'll find these houses with the, with the widow's walks. And um, so, so in a way, I'm, I'm using a kind of an amalgam of various sea captains' houses mm. that I have in the area, um, some, of whom, some of which are supposed to be haunted. So in a way, it's, it's, yeah, mm. it's based on a real house, except that it's like a bunch of different houses put together. Mm. Mm. I really love it. And, and actually, I was going to ask you um, about the cooking in it. Um, I was getting really hungry this afternoon reading this good, book, reading about all these wonderful recipes and thinking, you know, are these real? I mean, are you, are you, are you, do you cook? Are they... Yeah, I do. But my father was a professional chef. Ah, OK. So I grew up in a restaurant family. Uh, yeah. You know, and Chinese in general are totally obsessed with food. That's all we think <laughs> about. You know, if we're not thinking about what we just had for dinner, we're thinking about what we're having tomorrow night for dinner. So um, <laughs> cooking is such an important part of my life and, mm. and food as well. And that's, I think the other thing about it is that to me, there's this, this sensuality that goes between not only cooking, but also sex and how the two weave together. And you use mm. so many of the same sense, you know, the taste and the smell and the, and the sound of, of chopping onions on a board. Um, and it just felt like it belonged in this, in this, in this house. Yeah, no, it's, it was very, um, yeah, it's very uh, evocative of, of all those flavors and those things. So yeah, it's, I really was really enjoying it. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I really liked it. So um, yeah, so I mean, do you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, un about the story and kind of what triggers it and everything? Or um, yeah, um, yeah, it's about a, a a young cookbook author who has done something really terrible. <laughs> is feeling a great shame for so she flees her home in boston and rents a sea captain's house in a little town in maine um and the sea captain is still there hundred and something years later mm. his ghost is there um and she falls in love with him so uh, well he sounds very dishy actually i have to say yes, yes, it's very dishy. <laughs> <laughs> um it, it starts off sort of a ghost and mrs muir type of r romance um until she realizes a very dark side captain is he's a little he's a he's scary as a lover mm. uh, he's uh he's exciting and he's sexy but he's also scary uh and then she finds out that every woman who's ever lived in that house has died in that house and she doesn't know whether the ghost is at fault or whether there is a real human element going on or whether she's imagining the whole thing so it's you know i, I love to play with the reality of of what what does she see what is real and what is really her own shame coming to punish her. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm you should, it. I mean, and, and you should talk about, I, I know we've talked about your book, but we haven't actually talked about the plot. No, of, no, of story. no. So, so my book follows um, Alex, who's a documentary filmmaker who's, who's wanting to follow up her, her, her very successful first film. And um, she wants to make a film in which she, is telling the story of everyday life, but through the medium of people submitting their own videos. And that's one of the things I was really interested in. It's a little bit like this very thing that we're doing now, actually, you know, with Instagram and Instagram Live and things like that, people being driven to sort of document their own life. And that was something I've always really, or, you know, I've been really fascinated with, so um, fascinated by. So she wants to do that. So she, she decides she wants to make a, this film in a small town she's not sure where but then she gets a mysterious postcard which says come to blackwood bay and although she doesn't want to for reasons that at first we that we don't know we don't know what she's got against this place but she's sort of coerced into going there um partly because her producer has heard the story of a girl who apparently took her own life some 10 years previously uh, or, but there's a big question mark she realizes when she gets there there's a big question mark over whether perhaps this girl was in fact killed was murdered and another girl has gone missing in the 10 years since. Um, so she goes there and sort of gets sucked into this story and I think uh, kind of gets further and further, further away from the film that she originally wanted to make and gets more and more drawn into the mystery um, 
behind these missing girls in the village. And then we, we learn, again, it's difficult to, to know how much to say really, but we learn that she has more involvement perhaps than we'd realized at the beginning. So yeah, that's the kind of story, dot, dot, dot. Um, <laughs> yeah, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> More of a past with this town than even she realizes. So. Yeah, exactly, which is where the unreliable narrator thing comes in. Yeah. Right. So it's right. quite interesting because I think, and also with both of these books, both of our characters, aren't they? They're running away from something. Yes. Although um, mine is, well, yes, let's not say that because that is a spoiler. Yeah, but they are both running away from something. <laughs> Although in <laughs> yours, like frustrating, I don't know what she's running away from yet, but it sounds... Well, you'll, uh, yeah. you'll find out by the end yeah. what she's running away from. And she was a very, very naughty girl, so... <laughs> <laughs> right. She's, yeah. she's getting appropriately punished for, for what she did. Um, I'm interested in the documentary film side of it. Do, do you hang out with documentary filmmakers or where did you get um, that? No, I don't, I don't hang out with them, but I, I, I have known a couple. Um, and, you know, a, a very good friend of mine he was in a relationship with one, so I got to know him for a while. A while and um, yeah, and I've got another friend who, who is a documentary filmmaker, although I don't see her very much. Um, and I've, yeah, so I sort of, yeah, I've got a little bit of contact there, but yeah. it was, it was just that, I think, um, yeah, I think just because every, I think it's because everyone is a documentarian at the moment in, in a way, right. uh, aren't they, you know, and I think it's about create, curating, curating lives and curating our own life and our own sort of, the way we, yeah, yeah. W the way we present ourselves, which I think everybody's doing. And, and it seems that, especially the younger generation, feel, feels that that's something that they, they seem driven to do more. I don't know, because you you have children, don't you? Although, Yeah, well, oh, my, yeah. my son and I just finished um, a documentary. Uh, oh, wow, okay, yeah. And in fact, I'm, after this, I'm going to go listen to the soundtrack that just came in from our composer. Um, ah, so what, what's the subject? It's called Magnificent Beast, and it right. is about, we were following the question of why do Jews and Muslims not eat pork? It's, it's a very strange All right, thing. yeah. Um, but the deeper we dug into it, the more we realized this, the answer has to do with the essential nature of what is a pig. Um, so mm. we ended up going back in time and history and finding out the relationship between humans and pigs. And it ended up being a really fascinating feature for us. Um, we went around the world talking to pig experts and. I know people think, what do you, what do you care about pigs? But, but they're really, really sort of fascinating creatures. Yeah. Wow. And, and so, and so you're making, you've made that with your son. Yes. And it, yeah. we finished filming and we're just, we're just, now we're just waiting for the soundtrack to be uh, completed. Wow. We're, we're, really going to, we're going to listen to the first pass tonight. Lovely. Excellent. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, a, a, there's a question come through actually. They want somebody uh, wanted you to talk about the surgeon, which was, was that your first book? That was, well, it was actually my 10th, but it was my first. Oh, wow. I can tell you why I think it was your first. It's because um, I think it was the first one my mom read. And my mom, my mom, hi, mom. She's very excited tonight because uh, it's two of her favorite authors. In fact, her two favorite authors in, in conversation. So, uh, yeah. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, someone's asking about the surgeon. It's, it's their, yeah. They're saying it's their favorite book. Well, you know, it, it's, well, I think it helps that it sort of launched the entire series. So people like to go back and see where it all started. Um, and it's, it has to do with, I, I was just curious about the nature of what it's like to be a patient and what scares us about doctors. Mm. And um, I realize that what bothers me is that when you go in for a blood test and somebody takes your blood, where does it go? And mm. what secrets does it reveal about you? And what mm, if especially were now, used, with, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what if somebody would use those secrets to choose you as their next murder victim? So that's, that's really what started this, is mm. my, my background in, in, in medicine. Because mm. you, you, you are a doctor. Yeah, 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 I haven't practiced in 30 years, but I guess. <laughs> well, you've written a book a year, pretty much, I think, haven't you, in that, in that Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I'm, I'm, on my, I'm on book, I have to think about this, I'm in book 30, writing <laughs> Yeah, I managed three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just if you write a book a year and you just live long enough before you know it, you're going to be, you know, yeah. Gonna be I think it's the book a year part that I need to work on, actually. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Someone else has asked if you have any. You know, this is an interesting question. Will you have any anything? What's by your desk or on your desk as you're writing? Do you have any foods, beverages, or any kind of special item, good luck charm, or anything like that? The photos of my grandkids that's it <laughs> <laughs> and well i do i do you know what i collect seashells um 
And I don't bring home a bunch of seashells, but wherever I am, if I'm not in the ocean, um, if I find a shell, I'll bring it home. So I have this little bowl of uh, shells from everywhere from Libya to, um, to Cape Cod. Wow. Yeah. My, I have nothing on my desk. Well, I mean, my desk is loaded with, I'm looking at it now with just all kinds of rubbish, but nothing. It's all just stuff that's landed here. Bits of it's paper, mostly rubbish. Copies it's of mostly the rubbish. book. Yeah. Lists, to-do lists that, of things that never got done. <laughs> things like that yeah um so you write but do you write um on a computer or do you write by by hand or what's your kind of routine I, well i don't know about you but i'm i'm an old dog and i can't be taught new tricks so mm. I, just, I write my first drafts with pen and paper and it must be unlined typing really paper. yeah because i don't like the lines the lines bother me um, <laughs> so my first draft is in my own horrible doctor handwriting and then i type it in myself Right. Yeah. I think it's to me, there's there's this automatic, there's this real close connection, neuron, you know, in terms of neurons between the hand and the brain. And that just works mm. for me than sitting in front of a computer. How about you? Is, Mar Margaret Atwood says the same thing, doesn't she? That this, the, the, it seems to be a more direct link from brain to brain to item, brain to permanent record, I suppose. By doing well. the, the, first, the first three books that, uh, that I've published so far have all been straight to the computer pretty much. Um, but I've, but during our lockdown, um, which sort of started m mid March here, um, I have I'm touching wood now because it's it's still in that kind of very early stages. Um, I've written my, most of the draft of a new book, and I decided I would do it um, in longhand. So yeah, I've I've and I've become very obsessed with, with fountain pens. Um, so I keep I keep buying fountain pens. That's my that's my new thing. I think I keep buying fountain pens. So I get up every morning and I. What do you think about the difference? I mean, how is it different for you to tell the story with a fountain pen? It does feel, it, it's interesting because it, it did feel a different process. And I think partly because you, you can't really edit as you write. This is for me anyway. You can't really edit as you write, can you? Uh, in, right. in quite the same way. So you don't get, I, I wasn't getting quite so hung up on, should that be this word or this word or that word? And should, should the sentence be this way around? And is that paragraph better, you know, earlier or later? I mean, I, sometimes yeah. I had thoughts like that and I would draw big arrows on, this, on, the, on the, you know. Um, but I tried to just push forwards. And also I think because I knew... Even as I was writing it, I sort of knew that because the, I've also now typed it in, and uh, as you were saying, and so because I sort of knew I was going to type it in, it didn't feel as much pressure to get it right because exactly, yeah, That's exactly I thought right. if this doesn't work, if this ends up not really working, or not re this paragraph, or this even this chapter, or or there wasn't quite so much, but you know, if this section doesn't really feel like it's working, I don't need to type it in, you know. Yeah. It, it, um, so yeah, so it's quite. It's been quite an interesting. I can see myself doing it again. Um, yeah, see, I think that the thing about having it on the screen is you feel the need to perfect it, and you can't turn your editor off, your internal editor off. Mm. So when you're writing with pen and paper, you know I'm going to fix this eventually, and it allows at least, at least it allows me to have this forward motion without mm. stopping and editing everything to death. Yeah, and are you a morning or a, or a nighttime writer? When do you when oh, do morning. you write? Definitely morning. Yeah. Yeah, night night time is that night time is time for cocktail hour. That's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and but what time, time is it over there for you at the moment? Well, right now it's uh, we're five hours uh, behind, so it's all oh, right. Uh, so it's mid afternoon. It's... Yeah, yeah, because it's just nearly eight here. So, yeah, and I but I have water. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been drinking so much during lockdown. I shouldn't say this, should I? I've been very, very, very sober, sober during lockdown. So oh, I'm yeah. having a week of a week of no alcohol. Just water. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Yeah. Now it's it, it's two more hours for me till cocktail hour. So <laughs> <laughs> well, the book, my book, was launched last week, and so we had we had a we had a Zoom launch party. So we all oh, we all God. connected on Zoom, and and uh, Claire, my agent, who's wonderful, sent cocktails to everybody. So we, these little bottles, quite cool actually, <laughs> little bottles of cocktail that we sort of enjoyed. So we managed to do a launch party. Um, someone else has asked um, what what um, character from any of your novels you would be. Me? Oh, I, I am Maura Isles. I, that's, oh, okay. Yeah, she just came from me. And I, whenever I write her, it's like she comes from my own life. Everything she eats and drinks and, and knows about is something that I feel like I'm taking from myself. Now, mm. I, I don't see you as a character in any of your books. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't yeah. think I am. No. Um, it's funny because the, the one character that I feel maybe closer to in the new book is possibly the one you might not expect. Um, I actually feel most affinity with David. Okay. Um, but 
He's yeah, the I guess guy that hides out, hides out and he's kind of strange in the house. He's the one in the big spooky house on the cliffs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because he's misunderstood. <laughs> Slight, slightly an outsider, misunderstood, um, lives by himself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm going to see if we've got any questions actually, because there are lots flying up, and I, I'm not. It's difficult. I don't know if you can see. We've got you've got a lot of love from Istanbul. We've got a lot of people in Istanbul and Turkey that are that are saying hello. Um, yeah, please come to Istanbul. Did you oh, like really Istanbul? Good. I love Istanbul. I, I've been yeah. to Turkey four or five times, so uh, that's. I'm sure that's where um, a lot of them have come. Um, have met me. Um, have you been to the Istanbul Book Fair? No, I've never been to the book fair. I, I went there on holiday, but that was sort of, uh, must have been 20 years ago. Yeah. I loved, I'd loved it then, but I mean, I think, you we know, that was, that, was, that was before I was, uh, no, and that was before I was um, a writer. So yeah, it was different, different head on, but I did love it. Um, but yeah, but the book fair, you, you had a good time. Oh, I love this. Well, there are so many book lovers there. And what I mm. love about Turkish readers is how many of them are young. You know, when, right. my, my audience in the United States is probably women who are 50 and older. Mm. And you go to Turkey and the readers are young people, uh, mm. you know, young women, young men. Um, and you feel this. I think there's a lot of energy in that book fair because of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've definitely got a lot of love in Istanbul. I'm um, going to have a look at what else we've had. Um, will there be a new Rizzoli and Isle series? I'm writing it now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so is that the TV series or? Oh, the TV, or, series, or the, no, the TV series. I mean, the TV right. series. Uh, yeah, it went for seven seasons and it ended. Um, but I'm writing the uh, the 13th Brazilian Isles book now. Right. And does oh, that do you feel... want to talk about your, your movie, your movie experience with Before yeah. I Go to Sleep? Yeah, of course, yeah, because that's all happened since we saw each other last, didn't, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it was a very, um, it, was a, it was a really great experience. I think, because I, I think you... You, I don't know whether you, did you have a good experience with the Rizzoli and R series or do you want to I, I, yeah, I move on from that? I, I didn't really have much to do with it, but yeah. I, you know, I've been to the set a couple of times and I, and I got to do a cameo the last season. Did you? Um, yeah. yeah. But I think it was, it was a lot of fun to see that on TV. Yeah. No, I was very lucky because it was, I, I, um, I wasn't really involved other than I just had a lot of fun because um, the people that made it, Liza Marshall, who was a producer, and Rowan Joffrey, who directed it and wrote the screenplay, they were very keen for me to be involved. They're very nice people and they were sort of like uh, very respectful of it. But, I, but they, I didn't write it. I didn't have anything to sort of to do with it. So I just kind of had a great time. I mean, I, I, I think I've, I've realised, I think I knew at the time, actually, that I would never I would never have quite such a good experience again. I think I don't think you could possibly have a better experience of seeing your work turned into a film or turned into TV series um, just because I could go along as a fan, really. And, you know, I, I was there on the set and met Nicole Kidman and it was kind of that sort of stuff doesn't happen to me. <laughs> and, and yet there I was. It's very strange because, um, you, you know, film sets are really boring places, aren't they, actually? In most of it's people fiddling yeah. with lights and and waiting uh, around yeah. waiting around yeah yeah for the light to be right or the i don't know what <laughs> whatever they're waiting for so yeah so i was there staring at my phone playing a game probably or texting somebody i don't know and then uh yeah i feel a tap on my shoulder and liza says oh can i introduce you to nicole and i look up and it's nicole kidman and it's str strange because she's she's there in full wig and makeup and costume and she looks exactly like the character and it was uh -huh. very strange to see this 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 um this uh vision this this person that started off in my head uh, as a fictional obviously person imaginary person manifest and not only manifested as a living breathing thing but a living breathing nicole kidman it was kind of very strange so yeah it was a really it was a really great experience um yeah and it was very weird as well because obviously the book the book did really well and that was great but i i was i think i kind of sort of kept all my excitement in i mean i was very excited and very obviously very happy but i i've never been a kind of punch the air kind of you know i'm very english uh -huh. <laughs> i was all very kind of reserved and then uh, i remember the first time i saw the film i was sitting behind rowan and um the director and the producer and it was the first time i'd watched it and the end of the book i remember when i made when i wrote the book i cried when i wrote the end and when i edited it I cried when I edited the end and when I read the script I cried when I read the end and then so when I saw the film 
I just burst into tears. And I think it was because all these emotions that I had slightly suppressed kind of just came out. And I, when I say burst into tears, I don't mean it wasn't like just a, like, it was ugly crying. Um, and Rowan told me later that he looked, he looked around and saw me crying at the end of the film. And uh, he, he, he leaned over to um, Liza and he said, this is either really, really good or really, really bad. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, a, but it was a great experience. It was, it yeah. was just something I never, I never kind of expected to happen, you know. Um, so it was really, really lovely. And, and it's interesting the way that whole different, it brings a whole different audience to work, doesn't it? You must have found that with the TV series as well. It is. There's not, I mean, there's not a lot of crossover. People who watch television don't necessarily read books. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of there are a lot of changes that went from the book to the mm. the characters were quite different I think they look quite right? different. they're very glamorous on television and I yeah. did not have any intent of making them glamorous on the page mm. but it's American you know it's Hollywood what can I say yeah yeah and so did you find that when you then ha have written subsequent books with those characters are you able to keep the characters as you saw them or has there been some sort of bleeding into it as the way that they've been presented on the tv i i try to keep my characters the way i created them although yeah. i have to admit that when i'm writing now i hear angie Harmon's voice in my ear <laughs> whenever jane rizzoli talks <laughs> yeah i think it's impossible not to isn't it i mean christine yeah. will always be nicole kidman now for me but that's good because she did a really good job and she was quite close in the, you know in the first place I, was, yeah. I think i was lucky in that respect actually that the character they changed quite a lot in the film um, they always but, do. They yeah, always. but I, but I think it was always for good reason, and the character, the the sort of the heart of the character, was still very much the same. Um, there's another question. I'm just going to see what what uh, what's come through. Uh, how are you? We've had. Oh, and also we've had. How do you build your characters and setting? You want to answer that? <laughs> um, how do I build? I it kind of. I think it evolves. It evolves as the book goes, for me anyway, it evolves as the book goes on. I think this, this book was a little bit different because I very definitely, both my first two books could have almost been set anywhere, I think. And with this book, I very definitely wanted to make the location, the setting of it, much more of a, of a thing, of a, of a, I've always loved those books, like I'm getting from your book, actually. Um, those thing, I've always loved those books where the, the, the setting feels like a place in itself. Uh, sorry. Um, a character in itself so yeah so with this book I definitely wanted to set the set it there and sort of in its case of just building it from the ground up I think I, I had to feel real to me and uh, you know when people have said to me that it feels like they should be able to get on a train and go and visit Blackwood Bay that's really reassuring that I must have done a good job um, but yeah what, what so how about you well you know I, I think characters develop as I'm writing them I never know who they are when I start um, mm. And I liken it to meeting somebody for the first time. You don't know who they are, but after a year, you know them pretty well. And that's mm. the way I um, I'm, you know, for instance, Ava. Um, when I started writing The Shape of Night, I knew she was running away from something. And I did not know until almost I, until I almost finished the book what it was that she did. Really? So you don't, yeah. you don't plan things out in, 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 in huge detail then? No, I've never been able to. And whenever I do, I always change it anyway. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> was it you that told me when we, when, we, when we were touring 10 years ago, was it you that told me that a character of yours once changed sex halfway through? You realized oh, you'd written yes. a, a, as a woman and it was actually a man or vice versa. Yeah, a man turned into a woman halfway through the story and I yeah. thought oh, this was much better. <laughs> yeah. And was, that's interesting because it, was it that you felt it wasn't work? You couldn't, it was like the character wasn't quite working, but you didn't know why or... Um, it was, it, the book was Vanish. Right. And it started off with a character who wakes up in a body bag. Um, everybody thinks he's dead. And mm. then he takes hostages in the hospital, including Jane Rizzoli, who's, in, who's a patient in the hospital. Mm. And I got halfway through that story and I was bored. And the reason I was bored was because the people who take hostages in this world tend to be men. And mm. this was ho hum to me. And then suddenly I got this, this idea, what if it was a woman? Then it changes mm. everything. Mm, Why mm. do women take hostages? Why would mm. she suddenly become violent? Maybe it's because she's terrified. And that changed the dynamics of what was happening in the story. So that's, mm. that's what it was. It was, a, you know, yeah. it felt like something was wrong. And as mm. a writer, um, that happens to me all the time. I, you, you get this nagging feeling there's something wrong with mm. the story, what it is. And then a light bulb goes off and all is lightness. 
<laughs> that reminds me of something actually because i wonder how you feel about there's been a lot i don't know if you, it's been the same over in the states but over here we had a bit of discussion a couple of years ago maybe it was last year about um the fact that most crime novels seem to involve women being hurt or yeah. you know murdered raped abused killed you know yeah. and and that's a difficult one isn't it i mean i was wondering i wonder if you have a take on that of, of oh, kind I do, of definitely i don't yeah. do. is it one you could say <laughs> I, I can address that one. First of all, primarily fiction readers are women. Okay, so yeah. we are reading books in which we are the ones who are the victims. And it turns mm. out there's a real psychological need for that. Um, mm. When women read books like this, who are they identifying with? Very few of us identify with the cop. Very few of us identify with the, with the hero. I think mm. we identify with the victim. And mm. that makes it much more exciting for us. It makes it much more scary for us. And because of the market, um, I think a lot of people are, are playing to their female audience, which is giving mm. us what scares us. Um, and, and the same is true for children's literature. If you look at children's mm. scary, scary books, where, who are the victims in these books? They tend to be children. Mm. So, um, yeah, those yeah. Of us who, yeah, those of us who mm. feel maybe weak in society or powerless in society, Mm. We identify with the victims in these in these thriller novels. Mm. Um, when I talk to men, it seems like the men are always identified with James. They j identify with James Bond, so mm. they they don't have the same need to see themselves being threatened uh, in fiction. Mm. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there must be. I think there's an escapism there, isn't there? But I also think I don't know. There was there was a kind of move to to sort of move to try and move away from those kind of books but actually these things happen they do happen in life people they, you know they, we're not making stuff up that doesn't happen it happens all the time and so yeah, i think there's a, almost a responsibility to show it we're writing stories that readers actually seem to almost have a psychological need for to to feel afraid and then to feel triumphant at the end there's a mm. this, this real sense of relief at the end when your heroine is safe and the bad guy is captured um and you know, when I talk to women readers, I ask about what is it about serial killer books you like? Mm. Uh, they will always say, we, we are interested in books in which the victims are women. And I said, I would say, what about if the victims were men? Mm. And my female readers would say, we don't care about those. Those do not. <laughs> so it's whatever the reason for it is, and I understand it myself. Um, mm. That's the kind of book that I would tend to read, something where I could feel personally threatened in a story. It makes it scary for me. Mm, yeah, and I think people like that. I suppose it's a bit like a roller coaster thing, doesn't it? You know, you like you like being scared because you know it'll end, and you get yeah. off the roller coaster and you're back on solid ground. And I suppose it's the same with a crime book. You you mm -hmm. read this scary story, but you know that you close it, and then you you know you go and make yourself a sandwich or a cup of tea or whatever, and you and it and it, you're back in your safe world. Um, maybe it's that. Yeah. Anyway, we've got some more we've more more questions. So have a look. Uh, is there a new book project? Um, again, we've got Did You Love Istanbul? Although, I think, uh, yeah, is there a new book project? But I think you were saying you're writing another one now, right? It's it's a number 13 in Brazilian and Isles. And what, yeah, as far as Istanbul, I miss Istanbul, I miss the food, and I miss the people, and I miss the cats on the street, and I miss everything about that city. <laughs> <laughs> the food is incredible, actually, isn't it? I'd forgotten how much I love the Turkish food, yeah, and very and nice. People are, are, are very warm and welcoming, um, and I always feel really comfortable there. Mm. We've got someone from Q8 saying hi. Hello. Oh, That's hello. Q8. <laughs> I haven't been in Kuwait. I have to hope yeah, I'll get there someday. Yeah, no, no me neither. Um, uh, let's have a look. Uh, what, sort of, what sort of books do you read is one of the questions that's come through. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction, I have to say. I'm just, um, it's just maybe the, the fact finder in me. I love to read about food. Um, I was asked this question the other day, who my favorite author is, and I have to say it's, um, it's Michael Pollan. I don't know if he's known over there in England, but he writes about food and right. botany. And botany. And botany. Oh, wow, um, his, okay, yeah. His, the book that uh, everybody should read, I think, is called The Botany of Desire. And right. it's about the intermingling between humans and these four crops that have gone on through, through history. So mm. I didn't know of the history of the apple. I didn't know where who Johnny Appleseed was and how the apple came to America. It's really- No, no, nor me, yeah. 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 
We've just had what what was the book that made you want to be an author? Well, it was the Nancy Drew series. I, <laughs> <laughs> I you know, it's the I don't but in England what what do young boys read that are oh. sort of history series? I don't know really. Um, well, we had the famous Five in the Secret Seven, I suppose. Huh. Um, are, are those Eni Blyton? Is she is she a person over there? Well, I'm sure she's Not a person. Really. But... No, yeah. okay. In yeah. the US, in the US, it was the Nancy Drew series mm. about a detective. So, yeah. I mean, they they were when I was growing up. I don't I don't know whether she's read as much now because I think she's quite racist. Basically, <laughs> the books aren't very politically correct. Um, <laughs> but certainly when I was growing up, those were the kind of books. But yeah, for me, it was. I think it was actually the Lord of the Rings. I remember I read the Lord of the Rings, and I thought I want oh, to do yes. that. I want to create that kind of. Uh, you know, I want to I want to create worlds and tell stories and make things up. Um, so, yeah, um, someone's asking about hair growth book. No, I'm not going to be writing a hair growth book. <laughs> I can try. Um, but no, I don't think it's going to be successful. Um, yeah, but then for me, it was also then The Handmaid's Tale, which I read in my 30s, I think it was. And I remember that was the book that because I would always wanted to be a writer, but went off and had a career in the health service. A bit like you actually, yeah. yeah, um, we, yeah. we came to this in roundabout ways, but you know, when, I, when people ask me, what should you study to become a writer? I mm. think um, there's no field of study, it's live your life because mm. you're going to get so much out, mm. of, out of just your experiences. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I published my first book in my, in my, um, when I was 40. And people will quite often say to me, because I studied physics at university, and people will quite often say, do I wish I'd studied uh, literature or English or the classics or history even, or something which may have, may have um, you know, suggested a career as a writer. But actually, I, I think you're actually right. You know, I mean, I think I needed to have lived the life I've lived uh -huh. in order to write the books I write now. I don't know what books yeah. I would have written if I'd have, if, if I'd have sat down to you know, if I'd have studied English and then tried to write a book in, when I was 25, it might have been dreadful. Yeah. Yeah, I've, and then I, I would have so given much, up. It's so much more important to fall in love. I mean, that, that you're going to mm. get more material out of that than reading, you know, Dickens, I think. <laughs> mm. We've got an interesting question here. Actually, I'm very curious. It says, I'm cu very curious about the rest of the life of Mia's character in Vanish, is it? It's just, a bit, just a bit, ironically, the question has just vanished off the top of the screen, so I can't see it now. But um, yeah. saying they're interested in that character's life. Well, if they're wondering what happened to her at the end of the story, M Mila is, um, she's a trafficked young girl from mm. Belarus in the story. Um, and at the end, she helps them crack the case. Uh, in my own mind, Mila is allowed to stay in the United States and she becomes an advocate for women. <laughs> That's what, Excellent, um, yeah. But, <laughs> but you know, rest assured, she has a happy ending because she had a very, very unhappy life. Yeah, and someone's asked us to recommend thriller books. So I, I think I'd recommend mine and yours. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's what we're here for, <laughs> to talk about our books. Um, no, yeah. Um, and, but have you got any, any good, any, anything you've read recently that you would like, this is amazing, you need to read it? Um, I'm just thinking, right now I'm, um, I'm reading about, I think it's called The Secret Life of Trees. Here, I go back to, to um, you know, back to, to uh, nonfiction again, The Secret Life of Trees. Mm. I'm sorry, I, the, the author's name has escaped me. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's about how trees communicate with each other uh, in ways that we are not aware of. Mm. Yeah, well, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I'm really look, I haven't read it yet, but I'm really looking forward to a book called The Five. I think it's called The Five. Um, I'm sure someone will tell me if it's not, but uh, it's, it's about um, Jack the Ripper's uh, victims, but, but sort of about the victims, not about him. So get, okay. putting, putting his victims actually, actually centre stage rather than for, you know, for a change. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. Oh, Man, there's someone here who's obsessed with me growing hair. It's not going to happen. But thank, you, <laughs> but thank you for telling me my glasses are sexy. That's really nice. Um, oh, someone's put the five is amazing. So yeah, I'll get, I will definitely get onto that. That's definitely going to move up the to be red pile. Some more questions. Let's have a look what we've got. Um, what language do you speak? We've got here. Would love to see you create a male stroke female lead character, but with shades of grey, like a vigilante. That's an interesting question. I presume that's aimed at you. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so let me have a look. It's one more just popped in. Um, 
What are your spooky recommended places to visit in Maine if this person, Alison, ever gets to travel again? Oh, where would they go okay. in Maine? And where would I go in Maine if I ever get to go? Well, <laughs> yeah. everybody goes to Bar Harbor because it's beautiful. Bar, um, Bar Harbor. Bar Harbor. Yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's also, there's also a, a national park, the Acadia, Acadia National Park. Um, for the best food in the world, go to Portland, Maine. We have so many amazing restaurants there. Um, and then I, I actually live halfway up the coast in a little town called Camden. And that's mm -hmm. worth stopping into. Which is mentioned in the book, as I noticed that Camden, there's a Camden Herald, a Camden, a newspaper yes. story, yes. isn't there? Yeah, because we have, as you probably know, we've got Camden in London as well. So I believe there. the camp, you know, pretty much every town in Maine is named after a capital somewhere in Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got a question, which thriller book inspired me to write? Um, I don't know, really. What thriller book inspired me to write? I really, I remember I really loved... Um, Silence of the Lambs, that would be one of them. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the thriller book that's kind of changing or inspiring me now is, is probably Rebecca. Because uh, I love that book yeah. so much. And it is a psychological thriller. Um, yeah. So, uh, but how about, have you got any, any thoughts about which, which books may have kind of molded the way you write or the style that you write or the kind of books I that you have, write? Yeah, I would have to say it's, it's books like Rebecca. Um, yeah. It, you know, pretty much women's fiction. Um, when I was growing up, a lot of them had to do with Gothic novels. So yeah. they were all um, big influences. But then they, they were my teenage years. Mm. Yeah, it's funny because I was really put off Rebecca. Well, yeah, I mean, I was put off Rebecca actually for a long time because it was a classic. And oh, it was always, really? always, it was, all, yeah, I know it's, it's really sad and I regret it. <laughs> but it was always packaged as a sort of classic. And I don't know, I just, I think as well because the, the title, you know, I didn't know anything about it really, so I just always felt it wasn't really for me. And then, um, and then uh, my mom actually read it and said it's amazing. And I was like, oh, okay. And I, yeah, and I've, I haven't looked back since. Um, which book did you feel more intensely while writing? We've got now. Is there a book that sort of got under your skin, perhaps more than the others? I would. I'm definitely playing with fire. That right. Book. Um, that I couldn't stop. That, I. As you said, you cried when you finished writing your first book. I cried throughout that story mm. uh, because it's, it's about the Holocaust in Venice. Mm. Um, and to lose your character, to lose the whole family of characters mm. that you've come to love mm. by the end of the story and then to look back at what actually happened to them. Um, yeah, that was a really powerful story. Mm. There's, that, there's that quote, isn't there, about it, there's no tears in the writer, there are no tears in the reader. So I think That's there's got, it's, true, you know. Yeah has to come from a sort of fairly deep place, doesn't it, or else? Yeah. Um, are we going to have more Rizzoli and Isles? I think we've, talk, we've talked about that, haven't we? Let me have a look what else we've got. Um, what is your favourite book? Uh, of all time, favourite book. Oh, of all time. Oh, that's so hard. That's such a hard yeah. book. I quite often say Rebecca to answer this question now, <laughs> ironically. Um, but we've just spent quite a lot of time talking about that. So maybe I should name my second favourite book. <laughs> I love Margaret Atwood's work, actually. So one of hers, perhaps, maybe Cat's Eye. I really like Cat's Eye. I love, well, I can think of two books, actually. I loved The Shell Seekers and I loved Lonesome Dove. I, I have this vivid memory of finishing Lonesome Dove in a car. My husband was driving, the light was fading, and I was sobbing as they got to the end of the <laughs> Isn't it funny the way the books, sometimes the good books can really cement in your mind where you were when you read them or, yeah. or, or either physically where you were or where you were in your life or in your kind of life journey. It's quite, it's quite I, I weird, also isn't it? The books that stay with me the longest are the ones that make me cry. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the, it has to do with the lingering effects of sadness. Sadness can last with you for years, but happiness is so fleeting. If you read a book <laughs> and it has a happy ending, that's it. It's over with. You yeah. Know? But a book that makes you sad will stay yeah. with you. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't a question that anyone else has asked, but I've just come to me. So uh, do you have a favourite one of yours? Do you say 30 books or 20 whatever books that you've written now? Yeah. Have you got a favourite or is it like choosing a child? It is a little bit like that. It's, it's tough. I mean, I, I love my book Gravity because mm. I think that was the most challenging book I've ever written. Um, and I love, I love playing with fire because of the historical themes in it. Yeah, it's funny that it's the, the books that sell the best are not my favorite books. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. I've just the comments just gone just disappeared up the screen, but someone was saying, "Do I?" I think they're presuming asking me whether I think that twenty-five year olds shouldn't write, and I didn't. I don't think that at all. What I was saying was, me at twenty-five, when if I'd have been a writer at twenty-five, I don't know that I would have come up with anything any good. But you know, that doesn't mean anyone else who's twenty-five shouldn't write. Uh, more questions. We're almost at time now, so if anybody has any more questions, do put them in the question box. Don't quite know how it all works. Um, do, do, do. No, there's still a lot of people asking whether you're going to go to Istanbul again, which I think yeah. you've answered. <laughs> Who is your favourite side character? That's an interesting one. And where is your favourite place to live? I'm living in my favourite place right now. That's I wouldn't live anywhere but Maine because mm. it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful place. And it has, we're by the ocean, we have mountains and we have, we have moose. <laughs> yeah. So it's a great place. Um, when am I going back to Istanbul? When COVID is over. Mm. I'm, I just, I'm just anxious to get out of my own city. Is <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, and as for me, I'm living between my two favourite places. My two favourite cities are London and Brighton at the moment, and I'm about halfway between the two. So, um, I'm going to head to one or the other quite soon, I think. Um, somebody asked a really interesting question there, but I've forgotten what it was. Who's your favourite character in Gangster Granny? I haven't read it, but that's the same person who wants to know about my hair. So. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think it's probably time we, we wrapped it up quite soon anyway. So uh, it's, 20, it's flown by. It's been really good to see you again. Yeah, um, I remember. It, person, but... Yeah, I remember it was. Um, our, in fact, you were one of the first people that read before I go to sleep, actually. I, outside, obviously, outside my family. Well, I, and I still remember Selena, Selena Walker handing me that manuscript and saying, This is a debut author if you <laughs> want to read it. And I, and I started it, you know, in a ho I was in London. I started it in the hotel room, and that was it. Mm. So. Yeah, that's really, really, and you've been, it's, been, it's been lovely to speak to you again. It was really great. You gave me some great advice, I remember, as well. Because I was about, to, I was, remember I was about to embark on my first tour of the States, and you said, you'll be getting on a plane every day, or every other day, but probably every day. So only take hand luggage, because if you, if you lose your suitcase, it'll that's never it. catch up with you. Yes, <laughs> and I remembered that. Hey, good. So, yeah, my tour of America, I only took hand luggage. Um, yeah, so that, that, thank you for that. <laughs> that was that great advice. And thank you for this. This was a fun. This was a fun chat, and we're yeah. gonna have to get together next time I'm in London or next time you're in the U.S. Yeah, well, hopefully that won't, won't be too. As you say, when this when this awful uh, virus has has hopefully disappeared, or you know, is under control again, and we can travel. That would be absolutely fabulous. So, uh, yeah, I have to recommend your book to. I'm I'm loving it. I'm going to go straight back to it when this is over. It's really great. I'm really enjoying it. So. So thank you for that. Don't be shocked. <laughs> I will. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, do, I, might, I might wait till tomorrow because it's getting dark here now and I'm in this big spooky old house. So maybe I might, I might wait till it's bright and early in the morning and then, uh, <laughs> and then um, read it then. But it's lovely to meet you, uh, to see you again, Tess. And, uh, and good luck. Too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.